Okay. There we go. Okay. Can everyone see that? Okay, let me introduce you to our monthly speaker. I'm Bob Sewell, the president of the Houston Archaeological Society. And this, this month we have Dr. Alan Slade to talk to us about the Texas Folsom Fluted Point Survey. Uh, Alan is currently a postdoctoral researcher with the University of Texas at Austin in the Texas Archaeological Research Laboratory. And he's also a member of the team that heads the Prehistoric Research Project. So let me give you over to Dr. Slade. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for inviting me again. Um, just to see if this thing works. It does. Oh, the old fashioned way. Okay, so um, if you remember last year, I did a uh, <clears throat> little talk on the Clovis fluted point survey, and it was it was men uh, mentioned that I was going to hope to carry out a fulsome uh, survey to uh, which would complement that um, survey, um, which I thought was was a very good idea, and I started. Um, I well, started back in um, August uh, 2023. Um, the Clovis survey was just coming to an end at that time. Well, coming to an end from that current um, project. Um, hopefully, the both the surveys will continue uh, after I've finished doing it. And um, they will. That was one of the main objectives of the survey was it could sort of be self-running. It wouldn't have to be another researcher spends two years trying to update the uh, the surveys again so um for the Folsom survey um i broke it down into four main phases with a potential fifth phase and the first phase was a literature review and um looking at the previous surveys or the previous research that had been carried out on Folsom nothing like the Clovis. I mean, back in 1986, Dave Meltzer had the first Clovis survey, um, but there's never been a, a Folsom survey as such. Phase two was going to be analysis and interpretation of those results, very similar um, to the Clovis survey, which was uh, um, very successful uh, in doing it in this way. So I thought, why, why mess with it? And i wanted to do the same sort of process with the Fulsome. Um, phase three was going to be a, uh, to construct a data set and digitize the records. This is much better than keeping them in a hard copy format. They get damaged, they get old. Uh, it takes up a lot of space for the for a, a repository, whereas, you know, databases and digital records can be sort of well-maintained and um, that's what we are doing at the moment with the uh, with the Clovis, and the same process will happen with the Fulsome. Publish the final report will be the uh, making the the most of the phase four project will be to publish that report. Last year uh, in September, the Clovis survey was published, um, Slade and Meltzer in BTAS, and also a Slade paper, which. Um, process the results after the March the 31st cutoff date. When the when the actual BTS publication came out, I persuaded the editor um, over a couple of beers that I could publish a smaller paper which would complement the um, the main paper. And um, if you you can get that online or if by request, I could send you a PDF of that. Extend the survey to Texas borderlands would be a, I think would be a great um, benefit. Doing the survey in the Texas borderlands, I could, in, you know, I could also implement Clovis into that. 
when I was doing the Clovis research, a lot of points were coming up from in within Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Mexico. Not many from Arkansas, but there's only two state, two two counties that border Texas. But um, it, there is a lot of potential for that. Funding will have to be secured for that, or somebody else could take that project on after after me. But that's what phase five would be in an ideal world. So going to phase one, as I said, it was to build on the existing data sets from previous studies. Um, Hans Fischel in 1939, um, he managed to get 22 Folsom points from five counties. And that was the first real publication on Folsom points within Texas. Excuse me. <clears throat> Tom Hester, for his dissertation, um, part of it was a Folsom uh, account. And he, he made it up to 78 points from 15 counties. This is at the moment unpublished. Um, several people have asked me whether Tom is going to, um, or was thinking of publishing this as a as a standoff paper. Uh, I've spoken to Tom, and he's willing to let me have a go at it and um, keep it within much of the same format as his dissertation. It will just be basically finding a journal that would be prepared to publish it. There's a couple of online journals, and Tim Perler has just, uh, you might all be aware that there's the Texas, uh, the prehistory of Texas is going to be, or the archaeology of prehistoric Texas. It's an online journal, and it's going to be peer-reviewed, but the good thing is there's no, no uh, deadlines. It will just be published whenever. So that might be uh, a good outlet for that, um, for Tom's paper. Floyd Largent and others in 1991 put the survey, well, put his account of Folsom. This was published in um, Plains Anthropologist, and you can get that um, free online. Um, that was 329 points from 57 counties, bearing in mind that one of those, uh, one, one site in Culberson County, Chisba Creek, um, uh, revealed a hundred, so a hundred of those points just come from one site, and mainly bases or midsections, but no complete points or very few. On the map, you can see there's Colberton County and there's Chisper Creek. Um, these maps are again loosely based on the old regional um, breakdown. Um, what I don't do in my maps is I don't have this this line here. So this whole area is the uh, Panhandle Plains. This is quite a useful little map because this is the Panhandle and this is the Plains. Uh, north, cent north Central Texas, East, Coastal, Southwest and Central Trans-Pecos, they all remain the same. Um, if, if you can see those numbers, there the actual breakdown. There's 20 there, that's from Winkler uh, County, and that's from just one site. That 25 there and 13 there, those are from several sites. So, And over here, you can see these are the actual distribution of wholesome localities. It doesn't really uh, say a great deal, but it was, I just put it up there because it's an interesting, interesting map. Mm -hmm. And these were from um, Large and, and others in 1991. Perdler, Tim Perdler and Large and again, 93 and 95 respectively, took the survey up to 345 from 63 counties. And that's basically where it stopped. Um, Bowsman did something in the prehistory of Texas. He put a survey out where he um, noted fulsome artifacts and so unless you go through every account you don't know whether it's a flake a core or, or a blade or, or a fragment um, so it's been quite useful looking at the Bowsman um, research because it does show other fulsome sites so 
if I get time or if I get the, uh, the information, I will go through that individually to see if there's any um, any points lurking in that data. But that's where it sort of finished in 1995. Uh, another another uh, section of phase one was to carry out an extensive literature review, not just on the previous material, but to go through um, the site reports and other reports that mention Palo Indian components. I did this for Clovis, so a lot of the work had already been done because I was hoping that there'd be a fulsome survey back in uh, 220 and 221. So I did make a note of where Paulson points. I didn't have to go through all the reports again. And having access to the THC and TAL, THC being Texas Historical Commission and the TAL records, um, it's it's been very, very uh, useful and, and a very valuable source of research. I still reached out to regional museums. Uh, again, when I was doing the Clovis, uh, I made notes of where Folsom were, um, but other museums as well that I'd never got around to seeing. Uh, and whilst I was doing the Folsom, if a Clovis point turned up and I didn't recognize it or I didn't think it was part of the survey, uh, that was added on to the Clovis uh, survey. Carried, uh, maintained contact with collectors. They, they are an avocational archaeologist. They have been a great source of uh, information. And the, the trust is being built now. Um, they they get much more, they're much more prepared to share their um, collections with archaeologists. Tim Pergler and um, David Kalami and Tom Hester have been very important in doing that. And um, I don't sort of, I don't go to many collection uh, uh, collector shows, um, but sometimes I get invited to them. And I went up to one in Periton in the Panhandle. I went to Fredericksburg and um, there was one out in East Texas as well. Uh, so they can be, they can be useful. And um, I think my English accent bamboozles them sometimes because they don't, they don't really, they don't mind talking to me. So that's quite handy. So in phase two, uh, it was basically processing the data. This is um, so, so it's just broken down into taking the information from the record sheets, um, putting all the metric data into a spreadsheet, um, building a photographic archive, um, looking at the actual point itself, taking some notes on the raw material and the, um, the whereabouts of the location if known, and also any other interesting um, characteristics of the actual circumstance of the find can also uh, be useful. So Slade, um, I've got an asterisk by it because it's still ongoing. I've managed to take it from uh, the last total to 396 from 78 counties. Um, just since I've done this presentation of uh, two or three days ago, I've, I've, I've added another 12. So I didn't do that for this presentation. That will, that can come later. 51 new records, uh, 15 new counties. So that was quite good. That um, there's, there's, there's another 15 more counties that have uh, revealed a, a, at least one Paulson point. Another part of phase two was to be interpretation of the data. And again, it's going back to processing, um, having a look at the raw material. Where is it coming from? Is it similar to the patterns that Clovis had from, from their raw material analysis? Um, seeing where it comes from. Um, I don't know whether you can see that very well. I'm sorry. But uh, the one, the, the actual, the counties in red are the new ones. Um, Hudspeth, Jeff Davis, Hale, Gaines, etc. Travis County. Travis County was quite um, intriguing because you know that's you know where where we work in Austin, and I I had assumed 
that there was going to be um, already some false and points from Travis County, but uh, they were the first ones we saw. And I found those lurking in the uh, the tile collection, so that was quite good. So I'm sorry about the state of the table, but uh, if anybody's interested um, here or on, out there in Zoom, if you need a copy of this, I can send you one. So that's just a breakdown of the regional aspect. So Panhandle, Haynes, North Central, East Coastal, Southwest, Trans-Pecos and Central. Um, Trans-Pecos, as again, 117, um, take away the 100 points from Culberson from that one site, you, you know, it's a more realistic total. Um, the interesting thing about the Trans-Pecos area is that there's twice as many counties that reveal uh, Folsom than they did for, um, for, for Clovis. I'm sure that's an environmental uh, um, stat, really. Um, so when I come to do the, the final report, I shall be investigating that and sort of elaborate that a little bit more. Um, a comparative analysis is also going to be done in uh, phase two. I've already started doing that, and that's ongoing. So comparing the, the Folsom um, occurrences with the Clovis curve uh, occurrences, um, it's, already it's uh, proving to be quite interesting. And again, later on in the year, there'll be an update on on that. This is just basically an overview of the current status of the survey. So hopefully there'll be more coming out on that later. So <clears throat> not a map that you probably can't see very well. Uh, of the 78 counties now with Folsom, 10 do not have Clovis records, which is, you know, it's quite an interesting little stat. Um, more information will be um, sort of gleaned from that when I come to do the the some more uh, processing on it. But uh, at the moment, I don't know how relevant that is, and it might not be relevant. But it's just an interesting little um, little stat. And of the two hundred and fifty four counties in Texas, fifty eight still do not have either. Um, so if anybody out there can see a state, sorry, a uh, a county that they think they might have a Clovis or a Folsom, that would be very good and be quite handy to them. I know since those um, 12 points I mentioned a little while ago that I can add, I can add one from um, Hansford. I'll get up, I'll up in the panhandle. Um, Franklin, I've got a Clovis point from. A kill tree. Um, Stonewall, I've got a Clovis point. Wheeler. Upton, I've got a Clovis. Um, I don't know if any of you know um, Winston um, Ellison, but he's a collector and he's he's made his collections uh, available for me. So a lot of these points are coming from his collection. And when I did my Clovis survey, I mentioned one uh, another Houston resident, Dana Harper. He spends most of his time in Prague and Houston, separately, you know, sort of 50-50. Um, He's got a wonderful collection and he's got about 12 Folsom points that he's going to let me uh, have a look at. A lot of his points come from the Louisiana area uh, and East Texas. So uh, some of them might be from Louisiana. However, I've not heard of any Folsom points in Louisiana. So it'd be interesting to see uh, where his points are actually coming from. So watch this space. Look for more patterns is is uh, probably the um, the last part of, the, of phase two. Um, again, looking at the migration of the actual Folsom people. Don't like using that word because Clovis people I don't like using that term. But just to see where these points are coming from and if there is a clue in how they actually moved into Texas from, from elsewhere. That can be helped by looking at the raw material. Um, so again, that's going to be interesting to, to do that. Raw material, site location type. So um, 
already some of the patterns that are emerging. Some of the Clovis sites uh, have got different types of a site location um, attached to these points, like a kill site or a camp or a quarry. So it'd be um, what I'm going to try and do is have a look at the Folsom site, look at the site reports, and then it could be a bison kill. Um, it won't be a mammoth kill unless we started finding Folsom points in mammoths. But um, so bison kills um, still could be quarries. I mean, the Alibates um, quarry up in um, North North Texas, that could be uh, one of the places where um, quarrying could have happened and Folsom points. Down, we saw the site a little while ago, Culberson, Chispa Creek. That's definitely a maintenance camp. Um, you can tell that by just by looking at the points that are, uh, that are there. Winkler, Winkler County. Um, again, that's probably another campsite. So we're looking at the site types uh, in reflection to the actual point occurrences. There's not many points that just fall on the land, fall on the, the, land, the land surface. Whereas Clovis had a lot of surface finds, um, complete points. Not many of these are being found uh, as, as fulsome occurrences, but I will show you one that's coming up in a minute that, that's part of the exception. Environmental settings, as I as I just said, look, looking as if they follow rivers. Um, so that'd be interesting. Phase three um, is going to be to digitize the uh, the record sheets. So I can then hand them over to Tal and they can monitor that and put it into their database. And with the like with the the uh, the Clovis um, survey, I'm hoping at some stage this will be um, available um, for avocationals, collectors, and members of the public, as well as students and academics. The the way that PIDBA, the, uh, the Palo Indian database works, um, is that anybody, any one of you could just enter some details onto PIDBA. It's, it's, not, it's not monitored. We would like to monitor the actual material that goes into the, uh, the polluted point surveys of Texas. Um, we don't know how easy that's going to be. There's a gentleman from uh, uh, the Southern Methodist University, um, uh, Matt Boulanger, and we're, I'm going to be talking to him because he's going to take over from um, David Anderson from the PIDBA and two young lads, well, not young, but younger, um, Matt and Shane Miller are going to try and digitize the, uh, the database. So only data that they can confirm is what it is can go on there. So it'd be done similar to that. Um, obviously, a lot of this material is being discovered from um, sensitive areas because they've been landowners, ranches, and um, private collections. So we want to make sure that those personal details are not available. So it's going to be trying to trying to work out how we can do it so everybody can get some benefit out of that. So again, um, that's going to be part of the phase uh, phase three, which is going to be starting soon, uh, shortly. Construct a data set of the complete survey. So um, that'll be Clovis and Coulson. Incorporate those files into the TS. So basically um, you'll be able to see, um, it won't be too different data sets it'll just be one data set but it it will be obvious which one which points are clovers and which points are awesome phase four would be to publish the final report there's going to be that that's confirmed to be coming out in september 2024 the paper's not been done yet but um it's work in progress so it shouldn't shouldn't be too much of a great um challenge Hand over the hard copies and the digital records to Tal. So um, negotiations already uh, in place with the current new collections uh, manager, a lady called uh, Lauren Bouzier. And um, that will be 
in, implemented into the toll records. So um, we'll also try and continue to monitor the incoming records. Now, if my, if the funding continues and my position on this survey can still um, be maintained, I'm more than happy to continue doing it. Um, if I'm not and I'm elsewhere, I can, I'm going to leave it in such a, a, a position where it doesn't matter if I'm, you know, on the island of Santorini, I could still uh, put the put the actual records into the data set. It's that's how easy it's going to try. And, I'm, I'm hoping it to be, um, but hopefully I can. I'll be still here so I can actually do it myself. Phase five funding permitted. That, that great, the famous F word funding. Um, if that does happen during my tenureship of the survey, that would be fantastic to actually take this out onto the Texas borderlands. Um, starting with just the, the counties that border uh, the te uh, Texas, and just to see what's happening out there, and to see if there's the same um, patterns are are, are still um, coming from those neighbouring states. So, <clears throat> just well, you're probably all aware that you've got New Mexico, you've got. Um, Oklahoma, there's the two uh, counties from Arkansas, uh, Louisiana, and then you've got the, the four um, Mexican uh, states. I'm not going to try and pronounce the, the Tamalupas and the Colorful, I don't. <laughs> you probably know all those names better than I do. But, uh, Chihuahua and Nuevo Leon, I hopefully I've got those right. So just to show you the actual um the counties that are actually bordering uh Texas. Already I've got I've got evidence of Folsom uh, points coming from Cimarron and Texas. Uh we've got some from Ellis, we've got some from Greer, we've got some from Jackson. So there's there's definitely going to be some uh, some point uh, occurrences from Oklahoma which which we can add, and even if I don't get to do the actual um, <clears throat> borderland uh, phase in its entirety, these will be made available. These results will be made available to the individual societies from those uh, states, so they can add it to their newsletters or journals and for their own records. That's the New Mexico one. Just out of interest, for those you, you probably know, that's where the Clovis site of uh, Blackwater Draw um, is situated in Roosevelt County. And then you've got the Folsom type site up here in Union County. And so um, they're both they're bordering Texas. And in fact, Blackwater Draw, the, the actual draw itself, runs into Texas and it becomes whitewater draw and then it runs into the, the Colorado River. So useless information for somebody. Um this is the 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 uh, the data well the the, the, the states uh, counties from Louisiana. Um Sabine got a quite a few Clovis points for some from uh, Sabine. The interesting thing is they just look like Texas Clovis. So were they just verging into Louisiana? Um, the material is definitely Texas materials. Edwards Church, um, without a doubt, on some of these points, and those points were, were provided by Dana, Dana Harper. Uh, we've got points from Cobb and Cameron and Jefferson Davis. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see if there's any Folsom points lurking in Louisiana. Um, if you if you look through the archaeological record, very, very little um, on fluted points in Louisiana. So hopefully this this material, these um, these results can be um, passed on to colleagues in Louisiana and they can update their records. And just the the area of Mexico that uh, 
the tiny little bit. We, we, we mentioned how small the Arkansas uh, segment was. Uh, Nuevo Leon has got just this tiny little bit there. So um, that's that. So now just going to give you some, we've we got time for some more images. So just, just a little bit of fun looking at some nice images of, from some balls and points. Um, this one comes from the um, the Jenkins site in Atacosa uh, County. Uh, it's quite a nice point. Um, I've been told that this is similar to um, root beer, um, root beer chirp, which is a variation of Edwards. But it quite easily could be its own standalone raw material. Um, nice point here from Bastrop. Um, so one of the avocationals uh, and a collector I told you that uh, I'm um, keeping in touch with is a young, a young lad, and he is a young lad, called Gene Talbot. Um, he managed to acquire the uh, an area of the Elgin Quarry, just happened to be also the same area where the hog eye cache came from. And so he carries out his own um, little investigations and he contacted me back in uh, March last year when I was doing the Clovis. He said, Are you interested in a Folsom point? And I said, well, not yet, but I might well be. And um, he, he showed me this and um, it's, it's, it's marvelous. It's a wonderful little point. Shows some good um, fluting and flake uh, characteristics on both sides there. Nice point. This one was found from the um, the Galt site. So the Galt site, as you're all probably aware, is um, a multi-period, multi-component um, campsite, which is um, possibly more famous for the pre-Clovis uh, component, which is there. So um, it's got points all the way through the Paleo-Indian and later stages, but this is uh, one of the nicer examples of Fulsome. Um, got a little bit of a, an impact um, fracture there, and you can see that there's actually little bits of reworking on it. So it was actually, wasn't discarded because it got broken. It actually got sort of some sort of maintenance was carried out on it. So it wasn't discarded after the actual first, uh, first um, little bit of, um, damage was uh, undertaken. This is a very interesting point. Um, <laughs> funny story, uh, or an interesting story. Down in, I was down in Alpine at Solros and I went over to uh, Tolingua and then I was, um, we went out to um, go on to, you know, into Big Bend. There's a, a rock shop in Studi Boo called um, uh, Rocks and something, Rocks and Things or something. A very, very strange little place. The guy sells cactus outside the front of his store. And um, he's got a lot of uh, frames inside his store of arrowheads and um, nice stone artifacts that he's collected over the many, many years. And he says, you're interested in my arrowheads? I said, well, no, I'm interested. I said, looking, you haven't got anything a little bit older. And he said, oh. and he went into the back of his back of his store and you come out with this that was in a little box. And uh, he tried to sell it <laughs> to me. I was, as an archeologist, we're not allowed to buy anything. But I did tell Bob Maloof of Solos University and the Center of Big Ben Studies that he, he probably should go out there because, you know, It'd be a shame We're trying to encourage the, the gentleman to donate it rather than just sell it. Um, he's got no family, so he hasn't got no one to give the, give the money to or hand it down to. I think he just wants a better quality of life with it. But if he was to, to donate it, then it was always it was always going to be there for everybody. Um, it's It's got a great provenience. He found it when he was 12. Uh, a, a grocery store that's now underneath a car park in Alpine. So he's got a very good sort of uh, context of the discovery. Um, 
so it's I, I, I I just like it. It's a lovely point, I think. And it's uh, an alabates, and it's the most southwestern example of an alabate artifact in Texas. Um, there's some rumor of a uh, a flake, a Clovis type of flake that uh, is around in the the southern part of central Texas or northern part of uh, their coastal, but that's yet to be sort of confirmed because I've not found it. But as yet, that is the most southerly, westerly uh, evidence of alabates. This little point doesn't seem to be much, but this was found um, in uh, Padre Canyon, uh, quite high up in the Hueco Mountains. Doesn't seem to be that much of a relevance, but there's a site out in Colorado, the Mountaineer site, which is reportedly is a, is a, is a campsite on top of these mountains in in uh, northern Colorado. So, I mean, you know, what are Folsom guys doing up there? And this is it's just fascinating that this this little point or this little base, and the fact it is a base could indicate that it was also a, 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 like a campsite or. A, uh, something like that. Um, as you can see uh, where Hudspeth County is, it's right in the middle of Big Bend. Uh, I don't know exactly. You can probably go on uh, on the record. Oh, I should have done that before. I'll talk to you. Um, if it, is it Big Bend National Park or is it Big Bend State Park? I would I would suggest it's probably the uh, the state park. Um, the state park, you can, there's lots of ranches and um, private land, and it's easier to get permission to do research on them. You have to get permission, otherwise you will get shot, apparently. But um, they hate looters, and obviously it's very close to the uh, the, the security area of New Mexico. So um, the, the state park, um, does allow a little bit of, uh, if they're if the collectors are well known, then they don't mind them going on there. The national park, you can't do anything. You can't even take a, a cactus away. So um, this Judd Hoggins guy from who's got the arrowhead shop and the cactus, I don't know how he manages to get all the cactus, but he's he's obviously got some source down there. But um, so I would suggest that comes from this from the state park rather than the, um, the the national park. But I could research that a little bit more. Um, I've got no other provenience. This is one of uh, Winston Ellison's points. It's one of the nicer ones. It it it's a it's either a jasper or a sandstone. Um, it's it's also very quartz like uh, quartzite like. But it looks more like a sandstone or the or the actual yellowy uh, sugar quartz, um, which is uh, quite um, quite um, prolific down in 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 Mexico. So it hasn't come too far over if it if its source is in Mexico. Whoops. Um, this one um, you can probably go and see in your museum. Um, it's um, Harris County, Cypress Creek. Uh, I was allowed to um, have a look at this point. They wouldn't take it off display because the actual um, gallery technician wasn't around at that point, but they are going to be doing some work so um, on those galleries, so I might be able to get a chance to have a look at it properly. Um, they've got four or five Clovis points, but they don't come from Texas. They're from Ohio and New Mexico. But um, that's a really nice point. That's on a jasper. That is definitely jasper, and it looks like Tacovas jasper, which is from Mexico. This one I haven't got an image of, but um, it's from the South Fork of the Trinity River up in nor north central uh, Texas. Um, just threw that in there because I, I had nothing else from north Texas. That's Tim Pertilla who uh, reported on that in, um, I think, La Tierra, I think. 
So I want to thank the funding um, bodies who made this possible. Uh, phase one and two was done from the Summerlee Foundation, also um, funded the, the end of the Clovis um, service. I want to thank uh, the Summerlee. Texas Archaeological uh, Society funded phases two and three. Um, the Texas Historical Foundation um, is currently funding phase four. And North Texas Archaeological Society and you guys helped me with um, registration of conferences last year. So thank you very much. Um, conference, um, sorry, the GSAR are currently the um, funded administration. They've got the um, non-profit uh, 5013C. So thank you to them. These are just acknowledging some people who need acknowledging. And if I've missed anybody off, I do apologize. And there's another list of um, thank yous. Thank you all for listening. And I'll just leave that up there so people can see that uh, who, I'm, who I'm thanking. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Has anybody has anybody got any questions? Yeah. Dave? Yeah, I want to comment on the about the time frame well this Oh, do you have to ask me that now? <laughs> um okay, there's two there's two very interesting things that have um, there's two very interesting things about that. Everybody used to think that they were they just ran into themselves very conveniently for the textbooks and for the like the archaeological um, like sort of, um, academics. It's not that simple. Um, sites around North America run into the Balsam Age, and Balsam runs into the Clovis Age in some of these sites. You've got that. Jake Bluff site in Oklahoma, where Clovis guys are hunting bison, but they're hunting them like Clovis people, not like Balsam people. Um, there's that site I mentioned, Mountaineer site. That is definitely Clovis age, or so-called Clovis age. The real interesting thing, or the scientific fact, is that You've got a, a fan, you've got a famous geological event that separates those two, the end of the, the Younger Dryas, whereas the mammoths and all the megafauna disappeared, and you know, and then um, they were hunting bison, but it's not that simple either because the the Fulsom, um groups were much more nomadic and frequent visitors to other places because they were i think they by that time they were actually um using the bison herds and following those same as what the, the guys were out doing in siberia and russia with the uh with the with the elk and uh and the deer they were like they were, they were basically incorporating the animals into their migrationary um patterns so there's a lot more qualified people than me to talk about how Folsom people interacted with bison, but um, yeah, I mean, so you've got, um, if I'm correct, 10 0, 060 radiocarbon years is the latest confirmed Clovis site. So one would think, okay, 10059 would be where Folsom starts, but it, it's, it's not as easy as that. Um, so we need to look at that, and that's possibly something I can look at when we come to do the uh, the final report, where we're actually um, looking at the patterns of both of those. But yeah, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not that well educated on bison and how humans interacted with them back in the day, but. Uh, certainly something that we can look at. And somebody probably out there knows more than me on that. What do you mean, sorry? The, 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 morph oh, the, morph the morphology. 
uh, of the of the pot. Um, Pulsum are much thinner, very, very much thinner. And a lot of these points were made on flakes. So where you get like a, a biface or a, a preform and you work it down into into a into a Clovis point, the Fulsome were probably knocking these off of a of a blade core or a flake core and then work and they're much more they're much more economical. They're smaller. You, they're not trying to bring down a mammoth, so they don't have to be. They don't have to be this long, but still, I wouldn't like to throw a, a load of these little points into a bison because they're still. Yeah, and so the, the geometrics are very important, and that's what that's yeah, the. the so to me. I when someone tells me that they've got a Fulsom point, I want the metrics. I want to see what it looks like, and I'd like an image of it. But it's the metrics which are important because that tells us more about that. Yeah, yeah but there's a lot, and also if I can just, I know you got your hand up. I'll, I'll ask you in the second, otherwise it might start aching. Um, if I can get back in quickly, I'm going to do it. I'll turn it off. So if you look at one of these points, so the one what's in the on the exhibition, because then you can actually go and see it yourself, is that the the actual um the flaking of the fluted point, which which we like to call the flu or the channel, terminates there. Yeah, and so you've got so tracing the channel flake. Oh. You, they're much, they're much more, much wider, and they're much longer, and um, the actual edge trimming of a Fulsom point is very, very different to that of Clovis. Some people would say that the Clovis is the most um, uh, intricate and advanced technology, lithic technology in the Paleo-Indian. You talk to a Fulsom specialist and you'll say Fulsom is. And certainly it's harder to reproduce a Fulsom point than it is to reproduce a Clovis. As a, as a, some of you may have saw him at the Lithic Academy, Chris Ringstaff. He uses his foot as a vice. Mm -hmm. Bob Patton and Robert Lassen, they use a wooden or a bone implement to hold it. But Chris is more <laughs> he's, he's someone you should definitely get to. But Chris said, why would you have something like that when you can use another one of your your appendages? So and he's done it. I've seen him put things in his feet, hold it, so he's still got both his hands left. So, Alan, I've uh, got one question here, but I tell you what I'm going to do because we really do need to get out of here. Um, it's from our member Gary Hartman, and it has to do with a site over in Bastrop County. I'm going to give Gary your email address oh, with your permission, sure. And G you and Gary can get a little back and forth. He loves to talk about stuff like this, so you two will have a good time well, chatting with each other. Okay. So give me a wave to Gary and say, uh, <laughs> please. And anybody else out there who wants to, to ask me a question or if they need any information or may send them some uh, PDFs, just just please do so. Yeah, yeah anybody that's uh, listening in, just contact me and I'll give you Alan's uh, email if you've got address. If any awesome points, please let me know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Gary, for asking your question. We'll get to you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Everybody else, you know, help us to, uh, well, I'll go ahead and be your Okay. Outstanding. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Alan. That was great. Okay. I'm going to unshare this now. Thanks, Bob. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Again. Stop.
Stop the recording. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Because you still don't know exactly where it's from. I have no idea. Thank you. Thank you.